afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital, and we welcome you so warmly to another Barometer Readings webcast. On today's webcast, we have David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Officer, who will provide us with a brief macro overview. And uh, we have also invited our expert in commodities and oil and gas, our portfolio, one of our portfolio managers, Amit Joshi. So we welcome Amit to the program. And uh, of course, at the tail end of the conversation, don't be shy. You can uh, send us a, a question via the Zoom chat and the Zoom Q&A. So don't be shy. Get those questions to us. And with that, on this uh, lovely spring uh, afternoon, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hey, Pamela. How are you? Thanks so Great. much for hosting today. And thank everybody for, for joining us. Uh, we'll try and blast through some stuff today. Um, market's been, uh, you know, a little wobbly over the last week or so. Uh, things hanging in pretty well. I just think that the, we we got maybe a little ahead of ourselves and market just sort of chopped sideways a little bit. Uh, but internally, there is some real strength and there continues to be some areas of weakness. Correlations between groups has been relatively low, uh, which tells me there's very little a major macro impact right now. The market is doing its job. It's acting like a sorting hat. Uh, the good are doing well and the, and the, and the less uh, well-suited to current environment, a little bit weaker. So with that, just off the top, let's just start. You know, we continue to think we're in the structural bull market and equities that started in the U.S. in 2013. Uh, and post the correction that we saw between 2022 into 2023, uh, we came out of that in January and we're in sort of the next cyclical bull market. Um, as usual, uh, the pullback through 2022 was lower bound by this rising 200 week moving average, which is pretty typical. We got both time and price in that correction uh, and markets working its way higher. It's off about 0.66 of 1% so far in the month of uh, April, uh, just uh, coming up on halfway through. Um, but that's fine. Uh, we've had uh, several months in a row up. It's okay for the market to rest, maybe pull back one, two percent. Uh, but we think really the balance of evidence is that we get, you know, one to two years after each of these uh, corrective periods where we get relatively low volatility and the market marks its way higher. When we look at uh, the one year chart of the S&P 500, uh, this is the very sharp rally we saw off the October lows. And this is some of the sideways chop that we've seen here over the last uh, about uh, 10 trading days. Um, that's fine. And NASDAQ, it's a little bit more pronounced. And I think this is really where some of the weakness has been coming from. This is the NASDAQ 100. And we know how dominant the rally was in the NASDAQ 100 off the lows at the beginning of 2023. Really, for the first three months, big cap tech was about the only thing that rallied. And then we got to sort of middle of March. The market started to broaden. Uh, and we had uh, some different groups participating. Uh, but you can see that the dominance here in large cap tech has become less obvious. You know, we like to put this up. You know, corrections are typical. Although in the kind of market we're in, we don't expect any significant corrections. But you might you might get to two or three or four or five, three percent pullbacks over the course of the year. Um, I, I don't expect a whole lot more than that. You know, you, in an average year, you might get three, five percent pullbacks. We're not seeing any evidence of that at this point. When the market was higher, November, December, January, February and March in any year, going back to 1950, uh, the month of April tended still to be positive. A couple of small negatives, but up 81 percent of the time. The remaining nine months of the year was up 100 percent of the time and average 11.9 percent. So. Again, we don't make decisions based on this. It's just good to understand the range of possibilities. And historically, when you get four or five really strong months uh, after a corrective period, it tends to be the kickoff of a new cyclical bull market. So we all know just how strong U.S. stocks have been since 2013. We've been highlighting the outperformance of U.S. stocks versus the rest of the world. You know, um, this is... Uh, uh, been driven partly by corporate buybacks. You know, cost of capital was exceedingly low. Lots of bond companies selling bond deals, taking the cash that they're paying very little interest on, 
and buying back equity in the market uh, and, and generating you know, excess return that way. We had a lot of foreign investors, $1.8 trillion come into U.S. stocks over the last number of years, partly because global stocks didn't perform very well. Um, and, um, and so we had this great outperformance. I do want to highlight, I am not bearish on U.S. stocks. We are bullish. When we compare to other significant market peaks like 1970, the top 10 stocks traded 35 times earnings with a 10% profit margin. In 2000, the top of the tech bull market, the top 10 stocks traded at 42 times earnings with an 11% profit margin. The top 10 stocks in the S&P today traded 26 times, a significant discount to those numbers, with a profit margin almost three times as large as what we were seeing in those other periods. So this really is a golden age for U.S. stocks. But having said that, We've been highlighting that global stocks are trading at the biggest discount versus U.S. stocks that they have in 20 years, as they have for emerging markets. So to continue on with the story, Nikkei continues to perform well. 1991 to 2021, no real gains. 30 years in, they finally get some inflation. The stock market's taking off. Again, Warren Buffett this week talking about buying Japanese stocks. I wanted to highlight Taiwan, 2001 through 2020. Now, we all know there are geopolitical risks in Taiwan. And I think that probably helped fuel part of this pullback that took place uh, in 2023. But in 2024, once again, rallying. Now, this is uh, really driven by Taiwan Semiconductor. It was probably the most important semiconductor company in the world, producing chips for almost everybody. But Taiwan, another market that has come out of a long period of basing and is making, you know, making a, a beginnings of a new a cyclical bull market. India continues to chop its way higher month by month. Uh, Mexico, uh, sorry, Europe making highs and working its way higher really for the first time since 2007. Mexico made new highs in the past week, uh, going back all the way to 2015. Argentina. So we mentioned lots of Latin American companies, sorry, countries seeing their markets work their way higher. Obviously, some reforms going on in their government now. So we've highlighted that we have been seeing multiple expansion or investors being prepared to pay a higher multiple of earnings than they have in a few years. And the expansion is significant, but that's what happens in a bull market. When we look out over the next 12 months, U.S. earnings expected to be up about 7%, but we're looking for 12% earnings growth in Japan, you know, Eurozone up 19%. And part of that has to do with the sectors that dominate their market. There's a lot of sectors that do well in a reflating world, you know, sectors like financials and industrials, energy and materials. So TSX, a lot like those other markets, we highlighted that from 2008 through 2021 made no real new highs, which of course it then did. And we went through a global tightening cycle and we've had one, two, three, four, five, six straight months higher. And I just want to highlight, we are now at new all time highs in the TSX. So each of these global markets would point to a broadening of demand for the equity asset class. It's not just the US, it's not just technology. It's a broad list of sectors that happen to be important in global markets. And we've highlighted always that when markets go sideways for many years and eventually start making new highs, it's generally the beginning of a new structural or multi-year bull market, which makes us bullish global equities and continue to be bullish equities as a whole. Now, in fixed income, we had we had 40 years of declining rates and fits and starts, so a generational low in 2020. We've been comparing it to the generational low in 1949-1950 and highlighting the fact that what tends to work during a period where the cost of capital gets cheaper and cheaper is very different than when it's getting more and more expensive. By nature, we need to own companies that generate lots of capital and that don't need financing that have an ability to pay the shareholders. And so we've highlighted the fact that we think that dividend growth is a strategy we wanna focus on 
when the cost of, cost of living is going up, the broad mass of investors are going to need a rising stream of cash flow to help them live life. But very clearly, we did see a directional shift in interest rates, 1981 through 2000, now going the other direction. So we think that bonds continue to be in a bear market. There's nothing seems to be changing here. You know, the long end of the U.S. bond market, the 20-year bonds are still down almost 50% from when they started to decline in 2020. So stocks relative to bonds are outperforming, and this is something that we expect to continue. So, of course, we're focused on equities. When we compare dividend growth-oriented securities versus the bond market, Two realistic choices as an income investor, dividend growers are significantly outperforming and that doesn't show any signs of changing. So we know that when we got the last generation low in rates and rates started to work their way higher for the next 15 years, stocks went up 15% a year, bonds went up 1.6. So you can understand why we've talked to clients about taking, looking at all of the investments we have and reducing those that have to have fixed income, like a balance mandate, in favor of a dividend growth strategy. Now, <clears throat> we were all worried about the tightening cycle that came from the Fed and other central banks around the world. Over the last couple of weeks, we had things like the conference board's leading economic indicators after printing below 50, meaning contraction, from the end of 2021 through until the most recent month, this month, we or last month for the month of March, we had a positive reading, all without having an interest rate cut. The economy seems to be handling these higher rates, as we saw also in the ISM manufacturing new order data, 16 months below 50, and then we turned positive. Now, we think that we're going to get two to three rate cuts over the course of the year, but it is important to know there has never been a rate cut after the ISM manufacturing data turned back positive. So politically, we think it's most likely we'll see rate cuts and the market is sniffing out easier financial conditions, and that's having a positive impact on commodities. I mean, we saw a commodity bear market from 2000. Uh, 11 and some indices that are made up of commodities from 2008, making low in 2020. And I just want to highlight that this week we made a new high. So to me, if we look at it another way, you tend to get three major waves higher in price in a long-term bull market. The first one we saw was most unexpected from the COVID bottom through until the early part of 2023. Then we went through the global tightening cycle. This month, we are making new highs. So I think that we've started wave two of what will likely be three waves of a bull market over many years. And so we are seeing rotation in the market from things that do well during low interest rates to things that do better in a reflating environment. And commodities producers are one of those. If we compare commodities relative to the bond market, commodities made a new high this month. And frankly, if we compare commodities relative to the equally weighted S&P 500, RSP is the ETF. It looks as though after having an initial push and retesting from the top side, it's turning higher also. So this is an important structural shift. In the last month, we have seen some inflows into energy and into basic materials, but still, they are tiny in compared to the size of the market. Gold has had a very significant breakout of a long cup and handle uh, consolidation range. It was in place from 2012, a lot like it did after the last structural bear market. Look, after a couple of months, it sure wasn't over. Gold went on to rally 350% by the time we got to 2011. This is the type of thing that can happen. So we'll wait and wait, watch and see. But it tends to happen during a reflating world. The other thing that's interesting is it's not individuals or even institutional investors who are the buyers. The big buyers of gold over the last few quarters have been the central banks. 
looking for an alternative to holding U.S. Treasury bonds, possibly to keep their uh, reserves out of the hands of the U.S. Treasury in the event that there's difficulties. Uh, but this doesn't seem to be going away. Copper also has started to work its way higher out of a multi-year bear market. Uranium looks like it's continuing after it had a pullback three months ago. Agricultural commodities are making new multi-year highs. And when we look at what's happening in the market, it's really interesting. Since the middle of March last year, the equally weighted S&P is up 22.9%. The TSX is up 19%, recently outperforming the U.S. stock market. The aggregate bond index, despite expectations for rate cuts, up a measly 0.86 of 1%. By focusing in dividend growth, our tactical income fund is up 25.26% over the period, and it's almost entirely dividend growth focused currently. Our equity strategy up 32 and our global macro portfolio up 35.2%. So these things I think are focused in the right areas. We talk about global stocks and since we reoriented our disciplined leadership equity fund from North American equities to global equities, the MSCI all world XUS index is up 7.58% in Canadian dollars, up about 4.5% in US dollars. And our fund, same thing, up 9.7%, actually outperforming both the equal weight S&P and the TSX. So we think this is an important diversifier, and we've been speaking to clients about making sure that they have a component that's in this global equity universe. We think this could be really important over the next number of years. So look, we don't have to be everywhere. Our job is to identify leadership in the market, things that are being revalued. Always watch for change, new leadership to emerge, old leadership to recede, and have a willingness to sit on the sidelines in the absence of leadership. Well, that's not now. Our focus in our process is aimed at trying to identify the right neighborhoods. 70% of return is get to the right neighborhood, the right asset classes. Right now we'd say equities and commodities basic materials, energy, and the right sectors within those asset classes. 20%, 30% of return is finding the specific securities to express it. So my focus is the macro top down, try to identify those areas that are seeing net inflows of capital where there's a tailwind. And our research team is focused on taking the broad universe of equities and trying to identify specific securities that meet both our fundamental tests and that are technically favorable so that we can build portfolios of those securities. The last piece is that we run stop losses on all of the positions. And interestingly, we have been stopped on a few positions over the last couple of months, some of them in technology. So in general, we are always looking for areas of the market that have become underloved and where we see expanding breadth. Now I can tell you over the last year, as we built out our weights, in energy and materials, these were certainly unloved. And we had lots of questions from people saying, look, these are sectors that have been out of favor for a very long period of time. But day by day, one by one, stocks have joined the rally and we're in a point when it's becoming a much more broad-based rally. Now, eventually, late in the market rally, you'll start to see weakness, not in the leading stocks, but in the weaklings. The weaklings sell off first, often while the leading securities continue on. This is when it causes us to stop putting new positions on. We run these breadth models for different 300 different uh, universes of securities. This is weakness. Very often before you see weakness in the index, you'll see the weakling start to peel away first. This is how we decide to exit a group. So as we sit right now, markets have constructive breadth. When we look at our weekly data, the percent of stocks in the NYSE and uptrends ticked a little higher this week, a couple of percent. So we give every stock a single vote and track what percent of securities are in long-term advances. If that percentage is increasing, it means it's a broadening market, more and more stocks participating. We also saw some expansion in the Canadian market. Global market has gone sideways to down a little over the last three weeks. 
doesn't appear to be broad based, we'll watch it. And our short term indicators in generally positive percent of stocks trading above the 50 day expanding percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum did come in a little bit. And I mentioned that we saw a little consolidation over the last two weeks. I'll highlight that in a moment. But the percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows continues to expand. And the percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average the last 150 days um, continues to expand as well. So we think that we continue to be in a very healthy market. Let's talk leadership. Now, <clears throat> the most important group that we've been focused in over the last sort of nine months has been financials. Certainly since October, the XLF, which is made up of insurance companies, banks, um, uh, credit card processors, some fintech companies have been moving higher smartly. This is relative to the S&P 500. A rising green line means that the sector is outperforming, adding additional value beyond the index. And that continues to be the case. But you can see over the last eight days, it's come in just a tiny little bit. When we look at the long-term picture, one, two, three, four, five months up in a row. The fact that we've pulled back part of last month's gain doesn't worry us too much. I would say, though, that we just last, last month saw a new all-time high in the XLF, a new bull market after many years of going sideways. So where's the strength? Where's the weakness? Uh, banks have been working their way higher in general. This is the large bank's ETF. 70, better than 75% of stocks in the S&P 500. Relative strength is continuing to rise. Really pulled back a tiny bit last week, stronger over the last three days. Um, doesn't seem to be anything that we're too concerned about there. JP Morgan's our big holding there. It's trading better than 90% of stocks in the S&P. It's up 93% since the market bottomed in October of 2022. This is what a leader can do over 382 days, 93.3%. A little bit of weakness in insurance, pulling back toward the moving average. Relative strength continues to be in an uptrend, not too concerned there. Fairfax Financial is our biggest weight in the firm, in fact. Better than 80% of 85% of companies over the last 12 months continues to march along. So financials we think are fine. Uh, industrials, um, up 33% since the lows in October. It's a pretty hefty gain. It's been a very broad-based rally. We highlighted over the last few weeks that out of the, last, out of the top 10 or 12 relative strength stocks in the S&P, a number of them have been uh, industrials. In fact, uh, in the top 10 performers over the last 52 weeks, Eaton Corp, which is one of our largest holdings, is in the number 10 position, uh, has done very, very well. Basic materials. Now, this, I think, is interesting Basic materials had a great rally when rates reversed into like a reflating world. And when the global central bank started to tighten, basic materials pulled back and consolidated basically from the spring of 2022 through until the early part of 2024, where we then had 10 straight weeks up in a row, making new highs and again, another group starting a new long-term bull market. So whether it's the copper producers, you can see this sharp blast off over the last couple of months, or whether we're talking, well, this is tech resources. So one we've talked a little bit about, but it's now making new all-time highs uh, on the back of very few new copper fines and very tight supply demand. Whether it's uranium, We've talked about Cameco as one of the first material stocks to blast off in the fall of last year. Pulled back a little bit at the beginning of the year, now turning back higher again. We think there's a long way to go here. We look at some of the gold producers, like say Alamos Gold, which is a mid-cap gold producer, make new highs. As of three months ago, only 7% of gold companies were performing constructively, meaning an uptrend, higher highs and higher lows. As we sit today, that number is 52%. So when you go from 7% of stocks in uptrends to 50% of stocks in uptrends, it means the strength of the group is expanding. And that can get to 75 or 80 or even over 90 in a very strong bull market. So we see development taking place in that area. All of these groups are impacted by liquidity. 
So I thought this was an interesting chart from an analyst that I speak to at Paradigm. He was highlighting that the rate of change in global central bank balance sheets bottomed, well, in the late fall 2022 and started to improve. So this is interesting because if the central bank balance sheets are becoming a little bit easier, that helps reflationary assets. If we look at the M2 money supply, I talk often about the extreme tightening in policy in 2022. Look at the contraction in the money supply. But now we're starting to see it reverse the other way. That is supportive of reflationary assets. So that gets us to energy. And the energy sector we know was a wonderful sector from 2009 through 2014. Oil got to $160 a barrel. Fracking appeared to be changing the game. And in 2014, China started to slow down. They were the swing factor for demand. And when energy producers went down between 2014 and 2020, six years, 90%. Now, fortunately for us, our breadth models turned negative on energy in 2014, and we didn't own an energy company from 2014 through 2020. But in 2020, when the COVID low hit and things started to improve, energy, energy producers took off. They had a first strong leg higher, and we went through the tightening cycle, and about Three months ago, we started to see energy blast off and make new all-time highs. So this is an important group in Canada. It's 17% of the Canadian market. At the worst point in the S&P, it was only 3% of the market. Understand that it has been as much as 20% of the index in the past. Energy is a very important commodity. And the world probably isn't getting off carbon-based energy in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. As we noted before, we never got off any sources of energy, including burning wood in the history of, of man. So <clears throat> this is an important group and it's an important sector for the Canadian market. And right now it's the second best performing group uh, over the last year in the stock market and is really underheld. Now um, I asked Amit to join us today uh, to talk a little bit about some recent changes in the Canadian dynamics for the supply of energy and our ability to get it out of the country. So, Amit, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the infrastructure that we have here in the Canadian market. Sure, Dave. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I think this is a really important slide. I know it's a bit busy, but uh, it gives a good lay of the land of what we're currently seeing in terms of uh, the dynamics of the pipelines uh, in Canada currently. The top yellow lines that you see on each of those three sections of this slide are the maximum capacity that we have currently for these different pipelines. That'd be Enbridge, Trans Mountain, and Keystone. And as you can see, volumes currently are right up to the max of that capacity nameplate. So uh, there isn't really much room in terms of incremental capacity uh, going to um, foreign markets outside of Canada itself. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why um, Western Canadian Select, which is WCS Oil, trades at a discount to, um, to WTI, West, uh, West Texas Intermediate. Um, this here is a really important slide as well. This is the spread between uh, WCS and WTI. This is over the course of the last year. You can see the spread has been compressing a bit. Um, and the reason for that is we have the TMX expansion that's going to be coming online here. Um, as I mentioned, WCS trades at a discount to WTI. One reason being um, the, the pipeline capacity itself is limited. Secondly, there is a, a quality difference between WCS and WTI. Uh, WCS is generally a heavier oil compared to WTI, so it requires uh, more in terms of uh, refining and processing, so that costs more. And then there's also the transportation aspect of, of moving uh, the oil from Canada to the foreign markets itself. Now, in terms of TMX, this is a pretty interesting um, event for Canadian oil companies as it's going to open up additional capacity on the pipelines. 
Um, so just kind of an update on the project itself. Currently, uh, it continues to progress in terms of completion. Next major catalyst here would be getting the approvals from the Canada Energy Regulator. Uh, and at that point, we can move into, um, into uh, commercializing the project. The target right now for commercial commencement would be May 1st, so just around the corner. And what this means is currently TMX pipeline does about 300,000 barrels a day of volume. Um, the increase for TMX itself would be about 590,000 barrels a day, uh, taking the total up to about 890,000 barrels. And what this means for the big picture in Canada itself is about a 13% increase in volumes uh, over the over the total pipeline system. So I think that's pretty pretty interesting and pretty incremental. And having the ability to move more of that WCS heavy oil to foreign markets will result in uh, in better pricing. And I think longer term we could see that uh, discount, which you see right there, is about. $15.90 compressed to about $11 uh, and would result in more free cash flow for the companies that uh, that have a higher heavy oil exposure. So um, it, it not only impacts their ability to deliver volume, but also it will impact the profitability of that volume. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, correct. So if we go to the next slide, we can see some of that free cash flow sensitivity. Now, this is what I talked about, kind of that longer term $11 discount. Uh, if we were to kind of put that through the models for these companies, this comes from Peters and Co's. Uh, this is the free cash flow sensitivity that we'd see from that longer term um, discount on WCS on the company's free cash flow profiles. Um, and it's sorted from the largest um, market cap companies on the left to the smallest market cap companies on the right. But as you can see, a, a pretty incremental lift for many companies that uh, we would own. So when we when we look at something like CNQ, which we've talked about a number of times, Canadian Natural Resources uh, on this webcast, you know, we've talked about the impact of a bull market in commodities and energy prices. And the last one that we saw was 2003 through 2009. And, and, you know, between incremental volume as the oil sands were building out and uh, uh, improved pricing, you know, CNQ shares went up almost a thousand percent. And we're not forecasting that, but the, 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 the long term impacts of pricing and volume can have a really significant effect, not just on the earnings, but the multiple of earnings that investors are prepared to pay as they recognize there's been a structural change, right? After a long bear market, typically the multiples are compressed because people are frustrated and there hasn't been any progress. And when you start to see progress, people don't believe it at the beginning, but then ultimately over time, they recognize that it makes a major change. And our, our premise has been that after a very long period of frustration and lots and lots of pension funds saying we'll never own oil again, you know, prices are moving higher, volumes are moving higher. And as a result, debt's been paid down. The dividends are growing really nicely. In the case of CNQ saying they'll return 100% of their free cash flow to their investors. And oh, you know, the shares are starting to respond, but we think this is fairly early on. So you think, forget about global oil pricing, we could have improvement in that discount and we could have additional improvement in volumes that could have an outsized impact on some of these large Canadian companies. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, talking about C&Q and uh, it's specifically, it's about a 9% lift in free cash flow. And that, like you mentioned, that's for a company that's already paying 100% of free cash flow out to shareholders in, uh, in terms of dividends and share buybacks. So, uh, that's but, incremental but, and, and it'll so continue. Then does it also have an impact on Imperial Oil, which also seems to be behaving the same way? Yes. Yeah. Imperial Oil as well. Uh, you know, not maybe to the same magnitude, but if you go to the, the, the previous slide, we do have all of them there. Uh, you know, our positioning has been in the large cap liquid names. What we've looked at is strong management teams, operational excellence, and long life reserves with low decline rates. That's kind of been our thesis. Those are the safer energy companies that we feel comfortable with. They're the ones that have paid down debt 
um, over the course of COVID, have strong balance sheets, modest production growth, call it, you know, between five to 7%. And the mantra is continue to grow, grow at a modest pace and return all that incremental free cash flow back to uh, back to investors. In the case of Imperial Oil, uh, not only are they raising the dividends and buying back shares, they've been doing uh, significant issuer bids and buying back a significant amount of shares. Uh, they did two of those last year. Thoughts are they could do more this year as well. Now, looking back at that chart, this at the basket really stands out as one that could really benefit. Obviously, it's a, a to, to use vernacular, a little little higher octane uh, <laughs> than than uh, CNQ and Imperial. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, Athabasca is a really interesting company. It's, it's one we own um, in a smaller percentage. It is a smaller cap name. It's been a turnaround story. Management's done a good job here of cleaning up the company, selling off non-core assets, and the remaining assets are, are really, really strong, long-life assets. They are a heavy oil player, um, so they are very much exposed to this development with the TMX expansion. And as you can see there, it's a 26% lift on free cash flow. So this is huge. And, uh, you know, now, th they've also. This is a company that has not historically paid a dividend. Correct. They haven't paid a dividend given the history, like I said, bit of a turnaround. Um, I think the likelihood here is more for buybacks than it is for dividend growth. Um, but at some point, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do look at a dividend. But at this point, it will come through uh, share buybacks. Yeah. Now look at, I mean, we're, we are, uh, you know, uh, believers and we all have to be a good steward of the planet, but, but the truth is, you know, we look at the history of energy production, it's very difficult to get off a major source of energy. Um, you know, we we're big believers in being invested in, in the nuclear uh, power industry. We think that's a good source of baseload power, uh, but you know, it, for this foreseeable future, the world is going to need oil and it is going to need gas. And, and, and that's without talking about liquefied natural gas, which is a, an interesting theme as well. Thank, thanks very much, Amit, for jumping on today. I really appreciate it. No problem at all. We'll get, you, get you on again soon. Just moving on uh, from a sector perspective, we talked a little bit about the fact that, that technology, while it's a really, really important sector and some wonderful companies, has seen a little bit of waning relative performance versus the rest of the market. Um, it may just be that the group is consolidating after a big run. I just note that each of the pushes has had a little bit less power. Um, and we've seen some deterioration in breadth. We do know that people are really piled into this group. And for good reason. I mean, there's a lot of excitement about AI, uh, as there has been excitement about um, about cl the cloud providers and, and cybersecurity. Um, you know, lots of reasons to have interest. That the only problem is it's so well owned. And when we see groups waking up that have been out of favor for a long period of time and they're under owned, um, that to us spells a little bit better risk reward. Um, when we look at uh, some of the groups that have, have underperformed, we did note last week that there was some relative improvement in utilities. There've been a number of interesting research reports going around talking about the impact of, uh, of AI and um, these large language models that take a tremendous amount of computing power, more than any other uh, technology in history, and that it may uh, really increase the demand for power in the US over the next number of years. So it seems that the utilities are waking up a little bit. This is a great example of a, a group that we've not been in for the uh, last few years, uh, seeing some improvement there, adding a little bit of exposure, uh, just to, to, to see what happens, um, you know, certainly we're seeing some improvement in breadth there. Other underperforming groups, not much change. Healthcare continues to relatively underperform. Staples continue to relatively underperform. Telecom, uh, REITs, the defensives, the things that act like bonds, you know, continue to be tricky. So in our portfolios, not a lot has been changing. Our big weights have been financials, a significant overweight versus the S&P. We've had a significant overweight in industrials. These have been two very strong performing groups. Tech, you know, we have been pretty actively slowly taking our weighting down. It's about 13% down over the week from 17. Uh, energy, we continue to take up 
It's about 10% of total firm assets across the various pools and, and funds that we manage. Uh, materials, which are really proving themselves out also, uh, gaining a little bit more weight in the portfolios. Everything is incremental. We don't move in, in big binary steps. Uh, when groups work, we, we look at slowly adding to them. Um, so we're a significant overweight to the S&P. If you were just comparing to the Canadian market, we're actually a little bit underweight, uh, but they are more volatile groups. So we want to be cognizant of that. Uh, and in the more defensive sectors, really, we've, we have a significant underweight across the board. So those are really the only major changes. Things we're watching, we're watching credit spreads, but the credit market appears to be pretty benign. Bond investors are over time demanding less excess return to buy a corporate bond than a government bond. Uh, so that tells us there's no major concerns about credit quality. Even if you look at the double B bonds minus the yield on a triple B or high, higher quality bond, the demand even for, for uh, from credit investors on lower quality bonds for excess return is moving lower. So we think that the credit markets are performing pretty well. This is one we haven't showed for a little while, but it's the correlation or the degree to which stocks are behaving the same as one another. You know, when you get into a real macro event, it tends that everything starts to correlate together like it did in the, in the sell-off in, in COVID. Well, this is the opposite of that. The market has a very low correlation. The ability to build a portfolio with diversification is increasing, right? The fact that there are haves and have nots, it means that as stock pickers, we can make a big difference. And that seems to be showing up in the numbers. So that's something that we'll continue to show. And volatility remains in a low range, which is typical during cyclical bull markets. So no change here. So look, we, we are always watching for change and we try to be transparent and share that here on this webcast. As it sits right now, we think we are in the very early days of a cyclical bull market. We think it's likely that moving forward based on the breadth indicators we see right now that we're in a very constructive market and it should remain a relatively low volatility environment. This I think is one of the most important slides. It compares two ETFs. One is the S&P High Beta ETF. That's highly economically sensitive stocks. And how it's doing relative to the S&P Low Volatility Universe, which are the most defensives. And since rates bottomed in 2020, High Beta has been outperforming Low Vol. And basically, we're at new highs. This just tells me that we are in a reflating environment and that the credit conditions are improving, that business conditions are okay, and that there's really no sign in the market of clues that we are headed for anything other right now than a soft landing. We stay mentally flexible. Our job is to recognize change, but it's also to accept what the market is telling us there's a lot of smart people out there trying to figure things out. If things get more difficult, we're happy to get defensive. I don't think now is the time. I think it's tempting for people because the market's been pretty good. They don't want to get hoodwinked. Um, but I think that the path is higher uh, and likely returns are positive toward between here and, and year end. So we'll continue to do this every week. Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. I encourage people if they're interested in between we do post quite a lot of stuff on Twitter at, at Barometer CA. Uh, and if you want to go to our site and subscribe, we can send out, you know, additional content as we as we put it out. Uh, but if not, we enjoy seeing you here each week. Hey, David, thanks so much. We have a few questions today. So let me start with Lawrence, one of uh, our key viewers. Lawrence asks, David, do you think one should wait for dips to buy and increase gold, silver, and energy positions? I think that's a, a relative question given we had some great expertise from Amit today. Yeah, that's a that's a it's a good question. Let me let me try and answer that graphically. Um, you know, this is a a market of stocks, uh, and they're they're all different. Um, I'm just gonna pull up 
my screen here. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the, the GDX over a long period of time. This is the, the gold miners ETF. You can see, you know, went through quite a consolidation here over the last couple of years, just poked its head out uh, of that range. If we uh, make it on a, a different scale, this is a this is a daily chart. It's really only just broken out. Now, in the world of gold miners, there are some good companies and some terrible companies that they used to say, you know, a, a mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing on top. Um, so, you know, there's there's higher quality securities and there's lower quality securities. Um, you know, I look at some of them. If I look at like a five year chart, um, this is uh, this is Aya Gold. It's been one of the better technical setups uh, that that I've, I've pointed to. Um, it's just recently pulled out. What could it put like? So, so it's traded to thirteen dollars, like high twelves. Could it pull back and test eleven twenty five or eleven thirty? Absolutely, it could. Um, if we pull up um, uh, Alamos Gold, you know, it's it's been making higher highs and higher lows. It just recently broke out. My guess is it probably rallies before it pulls back, but I think that that's kind of interesting. If we look at a wheat and precious metals. You know, it's just sort of on the cusp of breaking out. If we look at an Eldorado, or that's not it. Uh, you know, it's, this is, again, these are five-year charts. Could it pull back to $19? Absolutely could. I think what I would say is I would want to have some exposure and some flexibility. Have the ability to buy some if it pulls back into support, but you want a position now because it's been a long time since this group performed well. And you could say the same thing about the copper miners. Um, you know, look, I, I want to be clear. We're, we're not, you know, long-term mining bulls, but we do get bullish when something changes for the better like this. Um, they tend to only happen every, you know, sort of 10 years where you get, a, get an opportunity, maybe longer. Um, so I want to make sure we have a position. We at the at Barometer have stayed with some of the largest cap best known companies, Agnico Eagle is one, uh, which is very well known by US investors and is one that 10 people have a tendency to go to. Um, so it's it's interesting. I think I think that, um, uh, you know, Kinross is not so bad either. These can pull back at any time, but my guess is and you, if you're if you're into a real bull market in, in precious metals, then, then, you know, you can see these things go up by several hundred percent over the period of the whole rally. Thanks so much, David. The next question is regarding pipelines. Any pipelines in the portfolios that we have right now? Yeah, we really haven't focused on the pipes. Um, and I'll just explain briefly. When you get into a world of rising interest rates, if we think that rates can go higher over the next many years, then companies that use a lot of debt to build an asset and hope to get paid up back over 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, it completely changes the economics. So that's why we said recently, we prefer to look through the lens to say that today, the, 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 the power in the world belongs to the lender. So he who has the gold rules, who, he who has the cash rules, um, we like companies that we would call our shorter duration assets. If inflation goes up, they can put their prices up tomorrow. So in a building, for instance, a building that charges rent and signs leases for 10 years, and then you get a bunch of inflation, you're stuck, right? You use a lot of debt to build a utility or a pipeline, you know, you can get stuck. So um, we're preferring to stay away from companies that need other source of financing to focus on companies that can self-finance. So that's why we don't have a lot of pipeline exposure. Thanks so much, David. Um, we touched a little bit already on commodities. I'll ask the question. Sebastian wants to know, David, are you concerned with the commodity prices moving moving higher? And he, he's asking, do you find that this could um, add to inflation? Will this not be a negative to the market? It will be for certain parts of the market, yes. You know, I mean, it's been our case now for a couple of years. Rates are not going back to zero. And uh, once there is some inflation, it tends to persist. 
So, uh, you know, I think you're hearing this, the, the uh, Federal Reserve sort of walk back the expectations of tons of rate, rate cuts. You know, when we came into the year, the expectation was there'd be seven or eight rate cuts. Now that's sort of like three. Actually, it's less than that, but the Fed is trying to trying to convince people that yeah, you anchor them at sort of three or two. Um, I I don't expect to see interest rates come down a ton. The fact that the leading economic indicators have turned back positive after the very aggressive tightening cycle that we've seen without any rate cuts tells us that this is a more normal world where the economy can handle higher rates. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, for people who are buying, inv making investments that, uh, in things that are dependent on low inflation, you know, like some of these bond proxies, I think that will make it tough. So we are really, really, really focusing on companies that have, a, have consistently raised their dividend every year. Because if we can get a consistently rising dividend stream, it's going to make that company very attractive as people realize that the cost of living is going to continue to go up. Thanks so much, Dave. And the final question uh, comes from Eric. This is also regarding commodities and uh, ESG specifically. So Eric asks, with Louisiana and other states uh, recently taking a stand against ESG and companies like BlackRock, uh, joining forces. Do you see this trend continuing, which will only help the commodity markets going forward? Do you think that that is a good thing? Um, what, what, you know, I think it's, that? I think it's tough. I mean, we all, we all care about the planet. We all want to make sure yeah. we do what we can do <coughs> to, to make sure that our kids have a wonderful future, but we also have to live life anchored in reality. And in the near term, it's unlikely that, you know, every car is going to be electric in the next five years, even though I drive one, um, you know, uh, this is going to take time. And, you know, forget about California, you know, look at developing countries who don't have the luxury of pushing as hard as they as they can. So, uh, look, I, I think the reality is there's been not very much money invested in capacity for certain types of commodities doesn't tend to happen when those companies are losing a lot of money and prices are weak. Um, the problem is that it takes a long time to bring new capacity on. And in the meantime, it means that the last marginal dollar of demand sets the price for every buyer. That's the thing about commodities. You know, if you're, if you're, if there's four people a day away from safety in the desert and there's three bottles of water, like how much is the third bottle of water worth? It sets the price for everybody. And so this is uh, it's just a truth that we that we have to recognize and and we can either be victims of, of, of inflation and see see uh, inflation eat our money or we can invest in things that will help us to offset the impact of inflation and, and that those are companies that benefit in that in that world. Thanks, David. And thank you, Amit, for joining us today. I think everyone loves to hear your views and uh, appreciated your, your time on tonight's program. So with that, David, I'll leave you with the final word. Great. Well, listen, um, we're here in April. Um, uh, you know, the election cycle is coming. Uh, market tends to firm up sort of June on in an election year. Um, we think that, um, you know, breadth conditions are pretty good, certainly if you're targeted. We'll continue to update, um, and if we see a change, you know, we'll talk about it. Uh, but right now, we think that there's a fairly clear picture for investors. And in general, I think many investors are wrong-footed, and that we're seeing some rotation that's going to have to go on for a while. Uh, and so in the meantime, we'd, we'd, we'd like to be there first. So um, thanks very much for joining, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you've got additional questions. We're always happy to talk. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Emmett.